Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, would you do the honors and sort of say a little bit about the meeting? Maybe that will be a nice. Okay, thing. I'll do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And shall I start? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. Good evening, and welcome to yet another, I think, a fantastic webinar which is being organized by Vipul and Raj. This is an, I think, nth webinar, and they've they've done such a such a fabulous job and, and I'm part of this webinar so I'm really excited to be in this. So here uh, I, uh, you know, I'm not going to take time because there are going to be two fantastic lectures and subsequent to that, we probably will look at what is the quintessential substance that we can carry home and then also address some of the questions which I do have and I'm sure a lot of us have because this is one area where we really don't have a lot of answers, a lot of gray zones, and it's a really a learning curve. And we've actually come up to a certain amount of standard wherein we can develop protocols of how you're going to identify and manage beyond what exists as level one evidence or guidelines, because that's definitely going to be areas where we have to think out of the box and find evidence for that. And that's the intracranial arterial pathologies causing strokes and that spectrum is huge mind you ladies and gentlemen it's just not atherosclerosis so we probably will be dealing with an atherosclerotic ICAD versus a vasculitis ICAD versus something which is non-inflammatory like a moya moya or dissection said so this host of essential and intracranial major artery pathologies which you know this part of the world is really prone to having a very, very high incident of stroke arrhythmia, almost to the tune of 12% per annum, which is a conservationalist, you know, uh, kind of an incident. In fact, it is much higher and it's almost 34% in the first, uh, you know, uh, couple of years. So let's go through it. Let's start off with the first lecture by Dr. Raj. And then we would have Vipul coming up with the rest of it, dealing with one, of course, the advances we have, which are humongous in the vessel wall imaging, which is over and above the luminography that we are all familiar with, and then the interventional aspect, and then we can summarize and take in questions. Okay, so here we go, the first lecture. Raj, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, madam, for that uh, nice introduction to the topic. So uh, we will be discussing a vessel wall MRI, uh, more of a simplified approach to how uh, we can interpret the imaging and match it with the pathological findings. <clears throat> so my objectives of the talk would be, I would talk, be, briefly talk about vesovesoro, the technical aspects of how to do the imaging, and in, in a great detail about matching imaging findings with pathology and briefly about the pitfalls of the imaging. So the first and foremost, I would like to discuss how the intracranial artery is different to an extracranial artery. So this artery X has a very uh, well-defined intraelastic lamina. This is the one on the left, whereas the artery Y has a paucity of the internal elastic lamina. Then if you see the external elastic lamina, there's multiple layers seen in this artery Y and you have vasovasorum in the adventitia of artery Y. So therefore, the extracranial artery is artery Y, meaning there is a very well-developed de external elastic lamina, and there is vasovasorum in the adventitia. Whereas the intracranial artery is devoid of the external elastic lamina, and there is absence of vasovasorum in the, in the adventitia. So how is the nutrition to the artery? Most of it is within the blood, well, from the blood within the lumen, and partly from the CSF as well. So the vasovasorum is the important uh, take home messages about vasovasorum. It's not present in the intracranial circulation. It normally develops, it can develop with age, particularly in the proximal segments of the intracranial arteries or in disease status. It has an artery, capillary, and a vein and plays a nutritive role and is usually present when there are more than 29 muscular layers. And what determines 
uh, formation of vasobesorum in the intracranial circulation is medial thickness and luminal hypoxemia. And the maximum is 15 millimeter of the proximal intracranial internal carotid and the vertebral artery that can form the vasobesorum with aging. So it can play an important role in disease status of intracranial arteries. And because it is usually absent, intracranial atherosclerosis is thought to be less uh, common. There are two types of vasovasora. One is the interna and the other one is externa. In vasovasora interna, the, uh, uh, the vasovasorum arises from the lumen of the main artery, whereas in externa, it is from a side branch. Now that we have discussed vasovasorum and later when we discuss the pathologies, we will uh, we'll discuss the role of vasovasorum in each of the pathologies. The technical aspects is just going to be one slide very briefly as to how we do. The normal thickness of the artery is around 0.2 to 0.3 millimeter. Whenever there is a disease status involving the artery, we think that the artery will thicken and therefore that can potentially generate a signal. To be able to uh, identify the signal, you should suppress the signal from within the lumen and outside the lumen. It's better to use a three Tesla MRI because there's a higher signal to noise ratio and we use a 0.4 mm voxel size. So the key principles are one is you suppress signal from within the arterial lumen and from the surrounding neighboring tissue. The second thing is you have to imagine multiple planes, the coronal, axial and sagittal planes and use multiple tissue weightings. Say for example, in this particular slide, I saw T1 coronal, T1 axial and T1 sagittal image. And when, when I say multiple tissue weightings, we use a T2 imaging and as well as T1 post contrast imaging to identify the type of pathology. So then the question comes on why we should do, be doing this imaging. One is to differentiate different diseases of the intracranial arterial wall to be able to see the not so obvious on luminal imaging. Can we really assess disease activity and can we assess response to treatment? So the first question is how useful is this, uh, this imaging? So there's a paper that has been published in Stroke in 2017, which showed that the rates of correct diagnosis increased from 36% to nearly 90%. And they had evalu evaluated 402 arteries. And they also found that the interrater agreement improved from 0.02 to 0.72. So clearly when you add wall imaging to luminal imaging, the diagnosis, the correct diagnosis rate significantly increased. As ma'am had pointed out, there are a variety of wall pathologies that we will be discussing through the, during the course of this uh, uh, talk. So the first and foremost is Moya Moya disease. So what happens in Moya Moya disease? There is thickening of the intima. The artery negatively remodels. That means the outer diameter of the artery is smaller than that of the normal vessel. There is atrophic media. So the intima thickens, but the media hypo, uh, hypotrophies, that is there is atrophy of the media. In vasculitis, what you see is there is thickening of the wall. There is inflammation that involves all segments, that is the intima, media, and the adventitia. And the internal elastic lamina is broken. What happens in RCBS? Again, there is luminal narrowing, but there is no inflammation in the wall. What happens is the wall thickens because the uh, media constricts, meaning there is overlap of actin and myosin, and therefore there is thickening of the media of the uh, uh, artery in RCVS. In atherosclerosis, what we see is there is lumen, lumen can be variable depending upon the type of remodeling. The thickening is eccentric and there can be inflammation in the plaque. So the first disease I would like to touch upon is intracranial atherosclerosis. And what we'd be discussing is the pathogenesis, the remodeling pattern, the side of plaque and enhancement patterns. So what is the pathogenesis in ICAT? So what happens is the first and foremost step is wall thickening. It can be due to hypertension, aging, diabetes. Once the wall thickens, what happens is there is hypoxemia. And when there is hypoxemia, vasovasorum develops. And this vasovasorum is an important factor in promotion of atherosclerosis. So it, is, it plays a key role in initiation, progression, and intraplaque hemorrhage. So what are the remodeling patterns that we talk about in atherosclerosis? There's what is called as positive remodeling and negative remodeling. Up to 37% of intracranial atherosclerotic plaques cannot be assessed by luminal angiography alone. So that's a sizable proportion. And we know that if there is positive remodeling, there's a five-fold higher probability of it being symptomatic. So some of the anatomical parameters one should know. Consider this yellow ring to be the outer wall of the artery. The 
the green ring to be the lumen outer wall. So there are two areas that you should keep in mind. One is the vessel area and the other one is the lumen area. So when you subtract the lumen area from the entire vessel area, you get what is called as the plaque size, which in turn will help us establish the plaque burden. Why is this important? So in positive remodeling, what happens is, this is, what, uh, this is a line art which shows you need to look at the vessel area at the lesion site and compare the entire vessel area at a reference site. And if you take the ratio between the vessel area at the lesion site by the vessel area at the reference site, it is more than 1.05, meaning the outer diameter at the site of the lesion is significantly more than at the reference site. The other key important things are the plaque burden is high, but the lumen tends to be maintained. There is a not significant uh, constriction of the lumen. So this is a phase where there is proliferation, there is inflammation, and this is a plaque that is likely to rupture and cause uh, stroke. What happens in negative remodeling? This is a plaque that is a healing plaque. In this, you have a thick fibrous outer covering. And if you see the area at the lesion site, it is smaller than the area, vessel area at the reference site. So therefore, the ratio will be less than 0.95. In this particular instance, the plaque burden is low, and the, but the lumen is also constricted in, in negative remodeling. So this is an aggressive plaque, positive remodeling. Negative remodeling is a healed uh, uh, plaque where the fibrous membrane is very thick. It has not ruptured. Now, one has to answer then, at what level of uh, plaque burden does stenosis occur? So this is an interesting paper that was published in coronary literature. So imagine the red line depicts the outer vessel area. So when the plaque starts, the outer vessel area starts increasing up to a particular level of plaque burden, and then it remains a constant. And then when it becomes negatively remodeled, it starts decreasing in size. Now let's look at the inner, inner the vessel lumen area. So what happens is initially they think that the lumen area can potentially increase and this they call, call it as compensatory over enlargement. However, there are uh, uh, disagreements with this, but when the plaque burden keeps increasing in the initial phases, the lumen area is maintained. But as the plaque burden keeps increasing further, the lumen area starts decreasing. So in coronary literature, they say that the threshold is 40% plaque burden, at which point you start seeing narrowing of the artery. How about in the proximal internal carotid artery? They say it is 65% plaque burden, at which point you will see narrowing of the artery. And in the basilar artery, it's, it is thought to be 55% plaque burden, at which point you will start seeing narrowing in the artery. A very interesting paper published in Stroke, which shows the posterior circulation arteries are more prone to positive remodeling and the anterior circulation arteries are more prone to negative remodeling. So let's look at an example case. This is a right MCA stenosis. And this is the vessel wall imaging. If you see, this is the T1 uh, <clears throat> sagittal section, which shows the reference site. And this is the lesion site. This is the pre and this is the post. If you see, there is a bit contrast enhancement, which is eccentric in the lesion site. But we are focusing on negative remodeling here. This green outer lining represents the vessel area, and the red outer lining represents the lumen area. This is the normal uh, uh, reference site, and this is the lesion site. If you see, the vessel area is constricted, the lumen area is constricted, therefore we call it as negative remodel, negatively remodeled artery. Compare that with a positively remodeled basilar artery. You see there is a sizable atherosclerotic plaque, but if you see the lumen is relatively maintained. So this is the reference site, and this is the lesion site. If you see the vessel area overall has increased in size, and the lumen has relatively maintained. And therefore, this is a positively remodeled basilar artery. So why is it important? So a lot of cases where we think it is a cryptogenic stroke could be secondary to intracranial atherosclerotic disease. And in one paper, they had mentioned up to 40 to 60% of lacrosse strokes can be attributed to intracranial atherosclerotic disease. And therefore, the need to look for these plaques, which may not uh, be uh, uh, showing up on luminal imaging. So the, now that we have discussed remodeling types, we need to know whether the remodeling type will predict the stroke risk. We know now from literature a positively remodeled plaque, there's a higher stroke incidence, there's greater incidence of intra-plaque hemorrhage, there's higher incidence of inflammation, and higher chances of microembolic signals. 
Now that we have discussed that, that we need to know which wall of the artery is prone to form this plaque and what determines plaque formation and which quadrant of the vessel is involved. So let's look at this sagittal section through a middle cerebral artery. This is a T2 sagittal section. So you can uh, uh, segregate, I mean, you can divide the artery in four quadrants based on these two diagonals. You have the superior quadrant, inferior quadrant, the ventral quadrant, and the dorsal quadrant. So you can have a plaque in any of these quadrants. In this particular instance, you see it in the ventral quadrant. So then it's an interesting paper which shows what is the common location of these plaques in the middle cerebral artery. We know now from this paper that the common location is the anterior wall or the ventral wall of the middle cerebral artery and the inferior wall of the middle cerebral artery. But if a patient has had a symptomatic ICAT, then we know that the common location of the plaque is the anterior wall and the superior wall and not the inferior wall. So we will come to that as to how it will tell us about what we should be doing while we are intervening. Say if there's a plaque in the superior wall and you're going to do a balloon angioplasty, we know that the perforators of the middle cerebral artery arises from the superior wall or the posterior superior wall. So when I'm doing a plasty, what can happen is the plaque material can go and occlude the uh, perforator ostium. The next one is looking at the basilar artery. Again, they have looked at which wall of the basilar artery tends to form the plaque. Again, you can divide the basilar artery into four quadrants by these two diagonals, the ventral, dorsal, right, and left. We know the ventral wall is more prone to form the plaque. So there's a greater plaque surface area and greater plaque fraction percentage in the ventral wall. And we all know that the perforators arise from the lateral wall. The next question is, why do we see a lot of positive remodeling in the posterior circulation? And that has been attributed to low wall shear stress, which we'll talk about in the next few slides, and the lack of sympathetics as compared to the anterior circulation in the posterior circulation. Now, I've already discussed which wall is prone to form the, uh, from the atherosclerosis. Now we have to identify, uh, know why certain walls are more prone than the other walls. And that is answered from coronary literature. If you see, if this is the left anterior descending artery and this is a left circumflex artery. What they have identified is the plaque forms on the wall opposite to the side branch origin. And this has been further looked into intravascular ultrasound studies. So this is an intravascular ultrasound of a coronary artery, which is aimed at looking which wall is prone to formation of plaque. So this is the outer wall of the artery. And this is the side branch that is coming out of this artery. So in this particular instance, the side branch is originating perpendicular to the wall of the artery. And these instances, what they have found is the plaque forms on the wall opposite to the origin of the artery. But we know arteries don't just take off perpendicularly. There can be an angle to the origin of the artery. Say, in this particular instance, there is an angled takeoff and the angle is clockwise. So they have found that the plaque forms along the arterial wall or in the quadrant that is towards the side that the artery is taking off. And in this particular instance where the artery is taking off in an anti-clockwise direction, they found that the plaque forms on the wall that is ipsilateral to the takeoff direction. So this gives a lot of information about why, uh, uh, in, uh, from this we want to know why such a phenomenon is happening. So this is a very difficult slide, but I'm going to try and make it as easy as possible to be able to understand flow velocities, wall shear stress, and why certain areas of the wall are more prone to atherosclerosis than other, other areas. And the best example would be, would be our ICA carotid bifurcation. So this is the common carotid artery. This is the internal carotid artery. This is the external carotid artery. Before going on to that, in any lumen, in any vessel, there is a central median area where the velocity is very high and there is an outer area which is the outer circumference just closer to the lumen where the velocity will be slow and this is important to understand this so what will happen so in at any bifurcation there is a flow divider this is represented by this blue blue uh, line art so whenever there is a flow from the common carotid artery into the internal carotid artery there's the central jet which at this point, this point, we call it as a separation point. So this flow will not abut the wall of the internal carotid artery. Rather, there is a space between this direction of this jet and the wall of the artery, which I have represented by this yellow, yellow area. So now this acts as a dead space. So there has to be flow into this space from somewhere else. And where does this flow come from? This flow occurs 
from the flow or the jet that hin that hits the flow divider so when this flow hits the flow divider the direction of the flow get all gets altered so the direction of flow rather than from being central it becomes circumferential along the outer wall so it becomes circumferential and the flow velocity drops and what happens is it reaches the dead space once it reaches the dead space there is a reversal of flow and then it takes another uh, u turn and then joins the main direction main central internal carotid flow there is another uh, uh, flow direction that can happen one is this high velocity jet hits the flow divider then takes a helical turn along the circumference or the outer wall of the vessel lumen reaches this dead space and then takes a helical turn and goes into the internal carotid artery so between these two jets we get what is called as the stagnation point so we have the separation point and the stagnation point and this flow is called as the recirculatory flow and the recirculatory flow has a much lower velocity as compared to the direct jet that goes into the, in the center of the lumen so wherever there is low velocity there will be low wall shear stress wherever there is low wall shear stress it promotes atherosclerosis so wherever there is bifurcation we know that this wall along the internal carotid artery and this wall along the external carotid artery is where you would find the atherosclerotic plaque forming not at the flow divider this is an interesting video which just shows the peripheral circulatory flows that enters the center and joins the main flow it may have been a little bit difficult it's just to give an insight of how wall shear stress plays a role and again wall shear stress plays an important role whenever there is a curve in the artery so what we know is there is less wall shear stress on the inner if there is a direction of flow this way we know the wall shear stress is higher on this wall wall shear stress is less on this wall so if an atherosclerotic plaque is going to form it will be along this inner wall rather than the outer wall so we have two types of stress one is the normal stress and the other one is shear stress we have talked about shear stress what is normal stress this is the force that is exerted on the wall of the artery in a perpendicular direction it is perpendicular to the wall of the artery whereas shear is a force that is a tangential to the wall of the artery and we are talking about shear stress so whenever we look at wall shear stress wherever there is a low wall shear stress there is activation of pro inflammatory cytokines the tnf and interleukin b 1b then this promotes high risk plaque features and there is positive remodeling whereas in various there is high wall shear stress this inhibits this pro inflammatory cytokines this keeps stable plaque and there is no progression in plaque so low wall stress is bad high wall shear stress is a problem now how is it important in our clinical practice two thirds of stroke are due to what is called as plaque rupture two thirds of strokes one third of the strokes are not due to plaque rupture and the mechanism here is endothelial erosion so let's look at it low wall shear stress means positive remodeling positive remodeling means high risk plaque therefore the plaque will rupture if the plaque ruptures then there is thrombus formation and embolism whereas in one third of strokes these are negatively remodeled arteries in negatively remodeled arteries the lumen is narrow wherever the lumen is narrow the shear stress is extremely high this high shear stress what it causes endothelial erosion and lifts the endothelium of the underlying matrix when this happens thrombus forms here there is no plaque rupture rather it is just endothelial ero <coughs> erosion so in clinical practice we see lot of these negatively remodeled arteries these are arteries which are prone to erosion and thrombus formation not plaque rupture that is something to bear in mind next coming to interventional aspect what is threatened uh, morphology of these side branches we know there are variety of plaques that can overlie these ostia so plaques which overlie the ostia but if it involves the ostium causing ostial narrowing by more than 50% those are the arteries by intervention can potentially occlude similarly a plaque which is going up to the ostium but involving the ostium causing more than 50% narrowing these are threatened morphologies which we have to be very careful in a paper up to 20% of these arteries occluded so this is again when you're deciding whether you want to go ahead with stenting or not where where sir will talk about it uh, in the next uh, talk we have talked a lot about how and where the plaque forms and which is symptomatic and what what causes the symptoms now coming up to correlation with uh, vessel wall imaging looking at the plaque contents the first and foremost imaging i would say is to look at the t2 imaging because this tells about the contents of the fiber uh, plaque 
so consider this to be the outer lumen of the artery so this is the lumen of the artery you see a hyper intense signal here and this hyper intense signal it represents the fibrous cap of the plug and then you see a hypo intense signal below it and this is the <clears throat> lipid core in this particular instance, this is an artery that has caused a problem. You see there is, this is the vessel lumen. There is a breach in the uh, fibrous uh, capsule. And you see the inner uh, lipid core that is being exposed to the lumen. So one of the important things in vessel wall imaging related to plaque imaging is look for T2. Look for the hyperintensity close to the lumen. And look for heterogeneity in the T2 appearance of the plaque. So this is another uh, vessel wall imaging which shows usually the enhancement. What is the enhancement pattern? This is a T1 post contrast imaging which shows that there is enhancement along the fibrous cap. The lipid core does not enhance and you see enhancement along the outer rim which represents enhancement of the vaso vaso rim. So this is a characteristic enhancement pattern which we not see. Most commonly it is a lumpy enhancement on, the, uh, on, the <clears throat> on, on one of the eccentric walls. Then comes to, can we characterize whether a particular plaque is going to be uh, 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 causing problems, a high risk plaque feature. So if there is a plaque hemorrhage that suggests a high risk plaque feature, one of the ways to look at is to look for T1 hyperintensity in the plaque wall. If there is a T1 hyperintensity, that means that there's a plaque hemorrhage, there is a higher chances of uh, uh, embolism from this plaque. So what the paper says is there was 30% more likely to have symptoms if there's a T1 hyperintensity as compared to 15% in one of the papers and another person paper it was 20% versus 2%. Now that we have discussed what you should look at T2, look at T1 pre-contrast, look for if there is brightness, that means that that signifies there is a hemorrhage. Now coming to extent of enhancement, they're graded as grade zero is normal what arterial wall enhancement. So you compare it with the pituitary infundibulum. The pituitary infundibulum enhances avidly post contrast. So if the enhancement is as much as the pituitary infundibulum, then it's a grade two enhancement. If there is no enhancement, it is grade zero. And anything between grade zero and grade two is grade one enhancement. So in this paper, what they have noted is that if there is no enhancement of a particular plaque, you can be reliably confident that that plaque is not a culprit lesion. And they've also come up with the conclusion that depending upon the extent of enhancement, one could say that potentially a grade to enhancement means higher chances that particular plaque was a culprit lesion. Now coming to what are the clinical implications for an endovascular neurosurgeon? So in a negatively remodeled plaque, we know the outer wall of the plaque is constricted. So these plaques, <clears throat> these arteries are smaller than the regular arteries. And when you're doing a balloon angioplasty, there is a higher chance of dissection and vessel rupture. That is why we say we do slow uh, angioplasty and do the angioplasty over a period of uh, time to prevent dissection and wall rupture. Now coming on to Post-tenting, even post-tenting, there are problems that we face. That is neointimal proliferation, neoatherosclerosis. These are entirely two different concepts. The neointimal proliferation occurs early, whereas neoatherosclerosis occurs late. Neointimal proliferation involves only the intima, wherein there is a proliferation of the intima and smooth muscles. There are no macrophages, there are no foamy cells in neointimal proliferation. And new atherosclerosis that occurs late, wherein you have macrophages and foamy cells that are forming. So the important concept I wanted to touch upon is after every strut, there is an area of flow change that occurs and there is an area of low wall shear stress. And this is a computational fluid dynamics which shows after every stress, there is, there is a low wall shear stress area which can promote new intimal proliferation and new intimal atherosclerosis. So the key learnings from this are, it is eccentric, it is thickened. We talked about positive and negative remodeling. Look at T2 heterogeneity. Look at juxta luminal hyperintensity and T1 hyperintensity, pre-contrast means plaque hemorrhage and post-contrast, we will see, you can see a typical pattern or a lumpy enhancement, which is eccentric. And one of the other important points is the enhancement remains up to approximately four weeks beyond that, the enhancement goes away. Now that we have discussed vessel uh, uh, atherosclerotic lesion, we are going to talk about vasculitis. And uh, uh, in this particular instance, the, 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 as we know, the wall thickens the lumen is narrow 
but it's a smooth concentric wall enhancement which you will get on T1 post contrast. And the reason for the enhancement is increased permeability of the endothelium with contrast leakage from the lumen to the anterior wall, or it can be vasoversorum related contrast leakage. So this is an imaging of uh, posterior circulation. You see basilar artery is narrow, the P P1 PCA is narrow. And this enhancement, if you see the wall is thick and it is circumferential involving uh, the entire circumference of the artery. And again, in the P P1 PCA, you notice the same. So the distribution and duration of enhancement, it can be short segment unilateral, it can be bilateral, single artery or multi-vessel. One of the important things is the inflammation can extend beyond the adventitia into the surrounding tissue and the median duration of enhancement is many months. So in certain circumstances where you're not sure about uh, atherosclerosis versus vasculitis, it is worthwhile repeating the imaging, uh, say after four to six weeks. And if the enhancement goes away completely, we know it is atherosclerosis and it's not vasculitis, as vasculitis can be eccentric sometimes. Can we assess disease activity? There's no clear evidence for this. There are papers from Takayoso arthritis and giant cell arthritis. Sometimes it enhances, but clinically the disease activity is not, bad, not too bad. So we cannot really make any uh, conclusion on that. Can we decide a biopsy site? There is only one paper that has been published on this. This is a whole brain vessel wall imaging wherein you can identify target vessels and do a biopsy there. In this particular paper, they had a yield of nearly 90% wherein they could identify on the biopsy some evidence of inflammation. Well, without uh, guidance, the yield of biopsy is low as we all know. Now, one of the important pearls, whenever you're confused with vasculitis, hey, yeah, or is it uh, atherosclerosis? One clue, as I've already mentioned, is to look for this T2 hyperintensity is juxtaluminal. Why can this confusion occur? Even atherosclerosis sometimes can involve circumferential involvement. Yeah, vasculitis can have an eccentric involvement. If you look at the T2, if there is a heterogeneous appearance, if there is a T2 hyperintensity close to the wall of the lumen of the artery, then it points definitely to atherosclerosis. Now coming to RCVS. In RCVS, as we have mentioned, this is a paper about subarachnoid hemorrhage, what happens in vasospasm. There is no problem with the intima as such. It is majority of the thickening is attributed because of the uh, media. So there is a uh, uh, five fold in the medial thickness. And that is why the lumen narrows. The outer diameter remains the same. And you have a smooth concentric thickening of the wall. There is usually no enhancement and it resolves in three months or so. So what are the main differentiating factors? We always have confusion despite it looks so black and white in whatever I have presented. First look for T2 hyperintensity. If it is present, that means it is the fibrous cap, which is, looks hyperintense on the T2, and that points to intracranial atherosclerotic disease. It is definitely absent in vasculitis and RCVS. Look for wall thickness. In ICAT, it's an eccentric wall thickening. With vasculitis, it is, it is circumferential in the majority. Up to three-fourths of the cases would be circumferential, but in one-fourth, it can be eccentric. That is where the T2 hyperintensity comes into play. And RCVS, again, it is circumferential. Contrast enhancement, uh, enhancement intensity. Usually in vasculitis, it's very avid. It's grade two. It is as much as the pituitary stock would enhance. In ICAT, it is predominantly grade one. It is between no enhancement versus avid enhancement. In RCVS, we don't generally see enhancement. And the pattern of enhancement is diffuse or heterogeneous in ICAT, but in vasculitis, it's diffuse and very small proportion RCVS can enhance. And in that instances, it is a diffuse enhancement. Now that we have discussed the three diseases which commonly we confuse, we go on to Moya Moya disease. And it's very interesting to know about the, what happens in the wall of the Moya Moya. So the first and foremost thing is I discussed about there is intimal hypertrophy. So the normal vessel is half the size uh, the intima is half the size. It's eight micron as opposed to 20 micron in the diseased intima in the Moya Moya disease. There is, whereas there is medial atrophy. So the media is smaller, meaning it is half the size as that of a normal vessel, 28 micron in Moya Moya as opposed to 56 micron in normal vessel. So a lot of times I've heard people think about, uh, talk about thinning of the wall of the artery in Moya Moya and whatever papers have looked at, it seems that it is an artery that negatively remodels, that is the vessel area, total vessel area drops, the lumen area also drops, but the wall thickness is either 
maintained or sometimes it slightly increases with progression of the disease. And this is the paper which shows that wall thickness is almost 0.25 at the onset, but keeps increasing to up to 0.5. So how do you differentiate moya moya from atherosclerosis? This is a uh, imaging which shows terminal ICs are involved on both, uh, both sides. You see on the <clears throat> T1, there is a uh, wall that is a negatively remolded artery with luminal narrowing and the wall thickness is relatively maintained. So the outer diameter in a moya moya vessel is much, much smaller. It is just two millimeters or so as compared to atherosclerosis, which is significantly higher. The wall thickness is not, does not go down or sometimes it can go up. So usually it is a maintained wall thickness, but as in atherosclerosis is significantly higher and it's eccentric. And the homogeneous signal on T2 is seen in moya moya. It is a homogeneously appearing wall in uh, moya moya, whereas in atherosclerosis, it's a heterogeneously appearing wall. So now we've discussed all the core diseases. One other area of interest is aneurysms. Can vessel wall imaging play an important role in aneurysms? We know vasovasorum does not play a role in initiation, but does play a role in uh, aneurysm growth and progression, particularly in aneurysms more than four millimeter and in fusiform aneurysms. It can identify unstable intracranial aneurysms and whether it can identify ruptured among multiple intracranial aneurysms in a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage. What also we have found is whenever there is a vasovasorum, not in the adventitia, but in the media, it is more fragile and it has a higher risk of neural hemorrhage. One of the pathogenic mechanisms in, in a fusiform uh, dissecting aneurysms. There's a paper which shows that if there is a circumferential arterial wall enhancement, then these aneurysms tend to be unstable. We know the arterial wall thickness is 0.3 mm, but the structure site is around 0.02 mm or so. These are, this is something of interest to me because we do coiling and we are very careful to prevent intraoperative ruptures. Another paper which says if there is a circumferential wall enhancement, which is more than a millimeter or so, these are aneurysms which are likely to be uh, unstable in terms of the change in uh, morphology over a period of time. There can be compressive symptoms and there is a risk of uh, rupture in future. And this is another patient where a patient has bilateral PCOM aneurysm, that is a diffuse subarachnoid hemorrhage and post uh, 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 contrast imaging, you see there is uh, enhancement and thrombus in the wall of this left PCOM artery. So we think this is the most likely cause for the rupture. On the right side, there is no wall enhancement and maybe potential value in identifying which aneurysm has ruptured. The last diseases I want to talk about is radiation induced arteropathy. So usually there is a history of radiation. It can happen many years down the line, five years, 10 years down the line. If you see bilateral internal carotid arteries are narrowed down, there is very, very low flow in the middle cerebral artery. Important thing is it enhances avidly with contrast and the enhancement is as much of the pituitary stroke. It can mimic a vasculitis like picture. But if there is a history of radiotherapy in the past and it is in the craniopharyngeal region, then we could attribute to radiation induced arteriopathy in this particular case. What differentiates it from moya moya disease? Usually you have a thickened wall. The enhancement is circumferential and can last for many, many years after this. So sometimes we think it is the enhancement is because of the vasovasorum, not really the disease process. The disease process may have uh, quietened, but the vasovasorum, persistent vasovasorum could cause this enhancement for a longer period of time. They say that the outer diameter is not reduced in moya moya disease. Some of the pitfalls, we know that after recanalization, you can get enhancement. And this is because of endothelial denudation that we see post-mechanical thrombectomy. Other pitfalls are when there is slow flow, then you can see an eccentric plaque-like structure, but you have to compare with luminal imaging. It was just flow flow, which was mimicking a plaque, but the luminal imaging shows that there is no atherosclerosis. Sometimes veins that are going very close to the artery that we can confuse it with for uh, 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 enhancement of the wall. A few cases uh, as an example. So this is a case one 22 year old female fa family history of fab uh, Fabry's disease as cataracts and skin disease with right hemispheric stroke. We all see that right terminal IC is narrow. M1 origin is narrow. The first vessel wall imaging thick, uh, thickened wall, con nearly concentric enhancement, a vid enhancement as much as of the pituitary stroke. She doesn't have any vascular risk factors. We thought it was a focal vasculopathy. This patient didn't want any lumbar puncture further investigations at that time. So we decided not to do it. 
Then comes 10 weeks later, again with recurrent strokes in the right hemisphere. Now what you see is we repeated the vessel wall imaging. Again, you see thickening of the wall. You see concentric avid enhancement as much or probably more than the pituitary stalk. And you see the narrowing has progressed in this particular imaging. At this point, we did a lumbar puncture. We did all that workup for this particular patient. We looked at varicella. We did an IgG in the CSF and the uh, serum. It was borderline. It was not strongly positive. We started on disease modifying therapy and, and um, antiviral drug. But within a week, she develops a further stroke. At this point, we have to decide what this particular entity is. One, we know the enhancement did not, uh, it was there up to three months meaning atherosclerosis is out of question. There was no vascularis factor. So we know uh, enhancement that persists for such a long time cannot be atherosclerosis. Second, we know the wall is thickened and very avidly enhancing. This means Moya Moya disease is out of picture because Moya Moya disease, we don't get enhancement. If the enhancement happens, it's like grade one enhancement. And it's very rare in 10% of cases when there is an infl inflammatory phase, only then it can happen. So Moya Moya disease is out of question. So it was a focal vasculitis in this particular patient. We couldn't really identify the cause. And eventually the patient went to um, Madam in Ames and the patient had a uh, bypass surgery done. Now coming to a second patient, 37 year old doctor with right-sided symptoms. You see the flare hyperintensity is there. On the angiographic imaging, you see this tight narrowing in the middle cerebral artery. This is the plaque imaging. So this is a T1 axial image. You see there is a plaque, which is, ex uh, there is a, uh, there is this eccentrically involved uh, thickening. Uh, this is the T2 imaging, which again shows an eccentric thickening of the wall. And on enhancement, you see a focal eccentric uh, grade one to grade two enhancement, which means this goes for a diagnosis of atherosclerosis because eccentric and avid uh, grade one to grade enhancement and thickening of the wall. All of these goes for a uh, atherosclerosis. This is a 35 year old female with right-sided symptoms, no underlying illness. You see a left-sided stroke. There is narrowing of the terminal ICA, A1, ACA and M1, MCA. This is a post T1 imaging which shows avid enhancement. If you see, this is the pituitary stalk. There is as much as pituitary stalk. So it's a grade two enhancement. There is thickening of the wall and it is circumferential. So in this particular patient, we thought it was uh, a focal vasculitis in this particular patient. And if you see one year later, we had done a follow-up imaging and there is persistent enhancement less than what it was before. So in vasculitis, the main reason for showing this case is that it will persist for many, many months. The last uh, uh, example is this is a patient who had a recurrent uh, stroke-like events. If you see, this is the supraclinal internal carotid artery. This is a T1 cross-sectional imaging, um, coronal imaging. If you see, there is eccentric thickening of the wall. This is T2 imaging. If you see, there is a hyperintensity along the, just by the side of the lumen. This represents the uh, uh, fibrous cap of the uh, atherosclerotic lesion. You see a hypo intense area, which would represent the uh, uh, lipid core. And on post contrast imaging, what you see is there is an enhancement of this fibrous cap. Very, very typical imaging. So if you have a confusion where there is a vasculitis, which is eccentric, and you want to differentiate from atherosclerosis, T2 helps. If there is a, a hyper intense lining, and, uh, and if uh, uh, and the other thing which would help is repeat, repetition of uh, uh, vessel wall imaging after some time. So the final take home message is looking at all the disease. This is the first one is the normal vessel. And if you are going to guess it right, this is the negatively remodeled artery. The lumen is narrow, but the wall thickness is relatively preserved on and on post contrast. This vessel does not enhance or very minimally enhance. So the diagnosis here is Moya Moya disease. Now coming to this vessel, this vessel is uh, not enlarged. The vessel area is maintained. The lumen area is lost. There is wall thickening and it avidly enhances. This is going to point towards a vasculitis. In a patient who has a good history of radiation therapy, then it can potentially point to a radiation induced arteriopathy. This is disease, something I have not covered. This is a pre T1 imaging, which shows hyperintensity in the wall of the artery. 
Uh, any hyperintensity in the wall of the artery would point to a hemorrhage in the wall of the artery, and this would point to an intracranial arterial dissection that can be identified on a pre-T1 MR. The last imaging is showing a, a positively remodeled artery. So both these intracranial dissection and the atherosclerosis, the outer wall is bigger than the normal artery. So this is both are positively remodeled arteries. They have eccentric wall thickening, and on contrast imaging, there is avid enhancement. This points to an intracranial atherosclerotic disease. And thank you very much for patiently listening. Thank you, Raj. You know, that was amazing. Seriously, I mean, such a complex stuff. And uh, you've been able to cover it so lucidly. It's uh, there are uh, your take home points with. Amazing. Seriously, I learned a lot. Thank you so much. But I think we'll take questions after both the lectures. So yes. thank you, Raj. And uh, Sorry, Vipal, ma I, I overshoot. I overshoot no, no, my time. No, I, I, you may have, but it was a pleasure listening to you. So okay. it's, yes, it's yes. worth it. Yes. Now, uh, Vipal, uh, you 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 are the host. You you need uh, to please awesome. come Such on. <laughs> you know that first time I feel intervention will not look so attractive, but I will try my best. No. So, uh, I have a simpler task of talking about interventions in uh, intracranial arterial uh, pathologies. And uh, so, let me just get going. One second. So, so first and foremost, of course, what we are going to discuss about internal atherosclerosis, that is where the main challenges are and most of the interventions are done. Just to summarize about the disease per se, you know, this was a recent article published in Stroke, that the risk factors are age and the important one, Asian and black race, hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, metabolic syndrome, sedentary lifestyle and smoking. And as Dr. Padma pointed out, we see quite a few percentage of patients presented with ICAD. And I remember a long time back, Dr. Padma had published from AIMS the incidence of ICAD by doing MR angiography in these patients. Now, over the years, although the, the, the risk of stroke has decreased, but as this paper reported, it still remains as high as 12% first year in spite of medical treatment. So we don't really know what are, 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 how to really get control of this disease. Now, here we have to understand a few things. Number one is the mechanism stroke in ICAD, and Dr. Ras talks has really helped me here. It can be artery to artery embolism in which we'll have a territorial pattern of infarcts which are larger than 1.5 centimeter. We can have due to hypoperfusion. We can be border zone infarcts or it, as he showed, it can be atheromatous encroachments on the opening of the osteoperforators in which of course be smaller subcortical infarcts. But the thing is a lot of patients are mixed patterns. For example, endothelial abnormality, it reduces clot formation and distal embolization, which is compounded by the hypoperfusion as well. So there is a mixed pattern in some of these cases. And we like to analyze these patients as to what caused the stroke. And as Dr. Raj has already talked about, again, whenever I see a lot of these patients, you know, 45 year old and stenosis, somebody advising stenting, but as discussed, there are a lot of diseases which can happen in these patients. And as Dr. Raj has discussed, we do a lot of imaging and you have to do a lot of testing to be sure to say that it's truly ICAT. And why this is important, this was one of the studies done in Korea, in which this is very important. When the patients were young, less than 55 years, and had zero or one risk factors for atherosclerosis, once they did vessel wall imaging, they found that only 27% fit into atherosclerosis. So that is the key here. Whenever you have a doubt, we have to do vessel wall imaging to be sure what is really all about. And since moya moya disease, arterial dissections, and vasculitis, are more common in Asians, this may be more of a problem in our country than even uh, in Western population and other, uh, other results. Now, how the treatment has progressed, uh, I will just skip this slide and go over. So one of the earliest trials, I will talk about medical treatment of uh, ICAD here, and because that is, remains the mainstay. So the VASIT trial was done, which compared aspirin versus warfarin, and one of the challenges here was that in spite of the treatment, the stroke risk remained quite high in these patients. What they found that the stroke risk wasn't different, but the warfarin harm had significantly higher hemorrhage or death, and therefore aspirin remained the mainstay. 
but recently a lot of trials have come in, chance trials came in. We know double antiplatelets can help in some of these patients. So what is the current recommended protocol of medical management in these patients? That means you do evaluation. If there is any doubt, you have to do uh, MR uh, vessel wall imaging as well. When there's a severe ICAT, until thrombus burden is high, then we think about giving heparin in these patients. Otherwise, what they say is permissive hypertension and bed rest for 24 hours. Double antiplatelet remains the mainstay. And then you, you control the blood pressure, continue the double antiplatelets for 90 days or so, and then continue on single antiplatelet. If patients recurrent strokes, maybe you can think about changing antiplatelet, and that is where the role of uh, angioplasty and stenting comes in. Risk factor modifications, whatever medication we do, stenting we do, that remains the mainstay of treatment. We include is smoking cessation, adequate physical activity, and dietary habits. Of course, you have to control hypertension, diabetes, and cholesterol levels. I'm not going into the detail of them, uh, of them because of lack of time. Now, important point I really enjoyed reading this, that physical activity was the most important factor in risk reduction. So, you know, whatever medicines we may do, the lifestyle modification by the patient, they remain very, very important in these patients. So this was in short about medical therapy, which as I said, remains the mainstay in this treatment. So where the role of intervention comes in? So this was the one big trial and a lot of interventions were very enthusiastic about it where they compared stenting versus aggressive medical therapy. This is the key, aggressive medical therapy. And they randomized symptomatic endocrine stenosis more than 70% to aggressive medical management versus endovascular therapy. Uh, and what did medical management mean in these patients? It meant two antiplatelets, statin, okay, and one medication from each major class of antihypertensive agent, patient compliance, risk factor management, life co style coach and exercise, and versus endovascular therapy with a strand known as wingspan stand, which was a dedicated stand developed for endocrine atherosclerosis. Now, the key thing here, the lot of focus is there on lifestyle changes. There was a lifestyle coach as well. And of course, to the disappointment of the interventionist, the trial was stand, uh, stopped prematurely because the complication rate, the event rate was much higher in the intervention arm. And beyond one year, at 30, beyond 30 days were 10%, both beyond one year, 3% versus 5%. And sadly, another trial, visit trial, which again, a different kind of stent system, and again, it demonstrated if you chase all stenosis, in the early phase, the complication rates were higher than the medical therapy. And based on these guidelines, the FDA changed the guidelines. They said you cannot use as a frontline therapy of the wingspan stent. And these are the guidelines. This is very, very important. So the, currently, the recommendations became that the patients who are between 22 to 80 years of age, probably because beyond 80, the complication rates will become higher, who have had two strokes in spite of medical treatment, and this is the key that you have to do the recent stroke, most had experienced the most recent stroke within seven days, less than seven days, sorry, before the planned treatment. That means there has to be a seven day gap between you plan for intervention. This was the key. And 70 to 90% stenosis, of course, patients should have made a good recovery. So the changes are here. It has to be recurrent stroke and you have to wait for seven days. And this really changed things. And what came around is the WEAVE trial, which was wingspan stent system post market surveillance. It was mandated by FDA, total of 152 patients. And what they found was once this protocol was followed of recurrent strokes and a seven day gap, then they had only 2.6% complication while they, they had decided upon more than four, uh, against the 4% rate set for the interim analysis. And this shows that wingspan stent, or actually to me, equivalent stents for symptomatic, a subgroup of patients do benefit from stent systems. So what is the lesson learned in this, all this journey? Number one, we mainly focus on patients who have repeat events on medical therapy, and then we wait for a week. Somehow in a week, whatever happens, the plaque stabilizes, maybe less hemorrhage rate. A lot of times there's a thrombus on the plaque that clears so for whatever reason, it becomes a much safer procedure. Another issue is we are only talking about wingspan stent in samples and we've trial, but you have to realize there are papers published with just simple angioplasty, okay? And the issues are high regeneracy rate intimal, but somehow it is technically easy at times. There are uh, papers published with different kind of stent systems, enterprise health system. I use a lot of enterprise in my own cases and with pretty reasonable complication rate, even long time back and, and, uh, and less rate of uh, recurrent stenosis. Interestingly, another kind of aneurysm stent, these are enterprises and aneurysm stent, which we have used for ICAD. And Neuroform is another open cell design, which sort of conforms to the wall better. 
and also those paper published for ICAT and where the success rate was 100% and with no complication rate in 71 consecutive patients. The best news is that more stents have now been developed. So once you have learned simpler stents, less exchanges, now the stents on Cumulant, which is known as Aclino stents in India, it is known as Credo stent. And which can be the good thing here is from the balloon itself, we can deliver this self expanding closed cell design stent for and dedicated for eye care with a good radial force. So what we have learned another lesson is that Sampris, everybody has to use just wingspan, which at times could be difficult, involve a lot of exchanges. One size doesn't fit all. You have got options of angioplasty, balloon mounted stents, and other, other stents such as Enterprise, and recently we have used Neuroform Atlas stents, and now the Credo stents, which sometimes work better in these situations, and that can reduce your complication rates. And this was the pub, uh, paper, multi-center registry uh, published from uh, China, in which 300 patients, almost half of them balloon mounted, half cell expanding, and they had only 4.3% uh, complication rate. And in balloon mounted stent, they usually uh, 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 use in patients older, who were less likely, more proximal stenosis, intracranial vertebral artery was very amenable, simpler kind of stenosis, and they tended to have less residual stenosis. So what another lesson we have learned, the experience counts. When experience centers report their complication rate, it is less, and definitely we need more local data. We can't rely on Chinese data or American data. We need Indian registry now that what is the complication, what kind of disease it is. Maybe as Raj mentioned, we should do more of vessel wall imaging. Is, is intracranial atherosclerosis different in Indian population? And how our population patients are responding to stenting? I think definitely we need this data uh, for ourselves. So what is our approach? Uh, we do medical management, which is, has to be optimized by the stroke neurologist and Dr. Ashnivas is there. We always discuss as a team, this is not like traditional see, rush into stenting. We never really do that. We always do a pre-DSA in which I will show you, we do angio-CT. That means we inject into arterially dye, get a CT scan-like picture, which is very high resolution, 0.1 millimeter. We study the degree of stenosis on angio-CT, morphology, any branch arising, whether the atheroma is extending into those branches, whether there is any thrombus overlying, what is the architecture of the plaque? We also study the indigenous, the eccentricity and the angulations, what are the collaterals there? And then we try to think over what is the mechanism of stroke. If I have any doubt that this may not be atherosclerosis, then we always do a vessel wall imaging. And then of course, those cases by and large, we don't do any intervention. And of course, our indication remains the same. As the FDA said, 70% stenosis with recurrent symptoms of medical therapy and we wait for a week. But to be very truthful and honest, I sometimes do offer to the patients with very severe stenosis, even first time when it's a hemodynamic stroke, particularly in my experience, basilar stenosis, when there's a single vertebral and severely stenosis intracranially or sometimes M1 MC with lot M1 MC when there are no great, uh, great collaterals and there's a lot of leptomeningeal uh, things happening, then we know I have a feeling that these are the patients, will, and they're younger patients, you know, not only 80 or 90, you are a 55 year old, 60 year old, then I sometimes do offer them the option while explaining them about the trials and that we don't really know and we can think about it. And then we always wait for a week. In the angiogram, if there is any overlying clot, then we wait for another two or two, three weeks and then only do a repeat angiogram, assess the degree of stenosis. We always like to see this known as Mori classification, where there's a short segment concentric stenosis, more long segment and always eccentric stenosis, your diffuse disease, but your complication rate will keep rising between them. This is the first case of ICAD I had done when I was in All India Institute more than 20 years back. And this patient had recurrent symptoms, severe integral stenosis bilaterally, and a lot of collaterals from P comp, but still she had hemodynamic symptoms recurrent. And we placed a balloon mounted stent in that era. We didn't have cell suspending stent. And you can see straight away the collateral disappeared and she stabilized. There are many papers on balloon mounted stent and uh, I feel, yes, uh, you know, I mean, they are good in the sense of less residual stenosis, but sometimes you can't really reach to the lesion very easily. And maybe there are more complications, although there are many groups in the world which use more of balloon mounted and they're pretty happy with their outcomes. I mentioned about thrombus and this is where it becomes very important to do vaso CT. Like this patient, somebody may say there's a severe stenosis, let's place a stent, but you can see some fuzziness around there. We do this vaso CT. And then you can see this is the plaque here. 
maybe there is an ulceration of this is a, as a Dr. Rasmus, there's a vein here, but what you can see, there is a floating clot around here. This is a plaque like this, a ruptured plaque with a floating clot. You try to do intervention in this, you're going to cause embolism and those, um, after embolism, it means the tissue may have a hemorrhage because you're going to push patients with a lot of drug. We never intervene in these kind of dissected and thrombus, thromba, with a thrombus plaque. We put them on an appearance of pump vial and antiplatelet and do a repeat imaging in these patients. Another patient who had a stroke, severe middle cerebral artery stenosis, had recurrent symptoms. But when you do the angiogram, you can see here there is some hyperperfusion in this territory. And one can see this is the stenosis. But the important point is when you zoom it up, what you can see again, stenosis. But again, you can see filling defects here. These are almost always, I see in very early stage, there are these filling defects there. And you try to do intervention the first day after stroke, you can cause embolism and more complication. So as I said, we wait in these patients. And when we waited, and now you can see the plaque has become very cleared. And in this case, all I knew was I we did a small angioplasty, opened the lumen, the perfusion immediately improved, and we left it there. This is a long time back. I didn't place a stent. It was an angulated artery, and I decided to engage the stent. So sometimes angioplasty can work, and then the medical therapy has an opportunity to remodel the plaque. Another case like this severe basilar stenosis, we did the angioplasty. Somehow, because of the torture city, this is before we had good distal access catheters. We couldn't get the stent in. We left it there. There was no dissection. And this is the follow-up MRA. What you can see, compare from this to there, it's looking better now. So later on, medical therapy could work around. So sometimes in selected cases, if stenting is difficult or high risk, angioplasty can work. As I mentioned, when you're intervening basilar artery, and Dr. Rashni was mentioned, you have to look at the perforators. We do always vaso CT. You can see this vessel is involved and diseased. And you can see the angiogram, multiple perforators arising here and stenosis of the vessel. We know these are the kind of cases which are high risk for intervention. Even if I have to do it, then I will not use a balloon mounted stent. I will do some maximal angioplasty and just place a self-expanding stent and if possible, avoid intervention. So as I mentioned, we do vaso CT, another case of basal or artery stenosis. You study all the perforators. This was a young man, 40 year old, chronic smoker, had recurrent attacks in spite of all the therapy. So what we did was we did angioplasty and stenting, and this is the enterprise stent placed in this case. You study the perforators by post vaso CT. You don't try to make it normal. If you can make the lumen 70% or so, that's fine. And these are cell expanding stents. In our experience, they remodel the artery more in longer run. And somehow I have less complication and less, less restenosis uh, with, wings, uh, with the enterprise stent as compared to very few wing span we did. Another patient, uh, I say stenosis, recurrent TIA instead of double interplatelets. And this is the reason there is a stenosis here, but you can see there is a big ulceration. And that's the reason probably he had recurrent attacks. And you can see severe stenosis in vaso CT. Now you can see the ulceration very, very well, which we really use to do all the measurements. And then you get the guiding high up nowadays because then you can control the wire very well and prevent wire induced complication, which was the major reason of complications in Sampras trial. We do the angioplasty. And nowadays I'm using the Neurofoam Atlas stent in some of these cases when there's a crooked artery because they conform to the artery very, very well. And, and you can see this is the post, the artery is well open now. And we do another angio CT to see the stent is well open. You can see some calcification in the plaque uh, around the stent as well. And this is the fall up. You can see the artery is remodeled now very well. And again, you do a CT to look at the stent as well. So what are the technical considerations here? We always, to reduce complications, number one, do it after a week. Look at the clot, it should not be there. We get a high stable guiding catheter. Nowadays we use coaxial system and distal access catheters to go right up to the stenosis if possible. We do angio CT for planning, crossing the wire in two planes so that you don't injure the plaque. Wire we position in a distal straight segment because, and we keep an eye on it, that we may assist in keeping eye on it, that it should not cause the damage there. Balloon inflation is done very slowly over one to two minutes, not an immediate one like in carotid. This prevents plaque rupture, plaque dissection. A lot of cases we do a self-expanding stent, whether in the past with Enterprise, Atlas, and now Credo stent. If possible, sometimes we use drug eluting balloon mounted stents because they are much cheaper as well. We rarely do post dilatation. We always watch for post clot and perfusion changes. If there are perfusion changes, then PP control becomes very important in this patient to prevent hemorrhages. Another patient with recurrent TIAs, small infarcts, you can again see severe disease of the IC on MRA, and then you do a DSA, and what we can see is a very severe stenosis here, some collateral flow coming in, I think because of, still because of embolism, he was still having strokes, 
And so you cross the stenosis very carefully under roadmap guidance. We did an angioplasty and then we placed another, uh, in this case, I think it was again an atlas tent. And, and, and now you can see the perfusion is much better. In fact, the AECOM AS, started uh, to fill, AC started to fill from the ipsilateral side and patient did pretty well. And again, as I said, we do a CT scan to look at this tent. How is this opposition to the wall? Is it well open or not? And it also shows us calcification in the plaques as well. Another patient, ICH stenosis, ulcerated irregular recurrent attacks. We decided if we can just get away with small angioplasty in these cases, because after the wingspan trial, we know ICA cases, they reach no more. We did angioplasty, but you have to again see very carefully, there's a dissection here. They are no choice. We place a stand. I think it was enterprise in this case, and we opened up the artery pretty well. And this is one case where we use credo. As I mentioned, these are dedicated integrating stands which can display through a balloon. So it avoids too many exchanges and it is meant for ICAT. So this has become becoming a recent favorite now. And this is one of those cases with MC stenosis. It doesn't look too bad, but in this angle, if you see here, in this angle, you can see it's very, very severe. And that is why in spite of medical therapy, he had recurrent attacks. So you have to get your guiding high up and sometimes there's a torture city. So it uses SIM catheter to go in, place an implants. And this is very important, get a long sheet up and guiding eye hub. Only when you are like this, your systems are stable and you can control your wire and the stents. Otherwise, your wire will jump around and cause hemorrhages. You get the guiding eye hub, again, coaxial system. This is the long sheath and wire guiding in this case. And this is inner 4 4 digital access catheter. So then we use this kind of system to get your guiding eye hub. You do the angioplasty with the balloon, which comes with this stent system. And then we deploy this stent. You can see the end of the stents through the balloon in this case and open up the artery pretty well. So a lot of precautions you have to take. As I mentioned, hemodynamic changes are the major cause of hemorrhage in these patients, particularly in a case like this, the severe MCA stenosis. Again, we always look for this perforator. Thankfully, the perforators were arising digitally when we know it is safer. You do an angioplasty, we deploy an enterprise stent, and we let it be there. You don't try to make it normal. But what you can see, this is before. You can see slow flow in the artery, and this is after. Suddenly, there's a much brisker and higher flow. These are the cases where you can have hyperperfusion hemorrhage in these small infarcts. So in these cases, we control the BP very aggressively. We never give any post of heparin in these patients. And the anesthesia, we have to tell them when they're extubating, that's the time BP rises. And we always explain to them that, you know, you have to control the blood pressure at that stage. Another case of basilar stenosis, recurrent attacks, again, so you have to use, in this case, we use a very thin wire because no regular wire will grow across this crooked. So we take a lot of care. We use a micro catheter to cross the stenosis, not to injure the plaque, and then angioplasty and enterprise stand in this case. So you have to take these kind of precautions, do a high resolution roadmap, by plane if possible, and then control your wire very well in a straight segment, and then the complication rates are even lower. This is the first wingspan I had done, the second wingspan of this country, long time back, I think 12 or 13 years back, Severe stenosis, recurrent attacks in this man. You can see this here, very bad arch, no distal excess catheter at that time. We couldn't access the artery. So we did a direct carotid puncture. You have to be ready for some of these situations in this. We placed a wingspan stand, but the stand wouldn't open up completely. And that's the reason when you do CT scan, what you see, there's an eccentric dense calcification. You can see there, that's a wingspan, but patient did very well, his symptoms disappeared. He was crazily happy. And in this case, we got a surgical closure of our puncture site done and we got it and patient did quite well. Sometimes it can be a tandem stenosis like this, severe intercranial stenosis. And you can see at the origin also severe stenosis. So what we have learned is if you open only one, then the stent don't remain open. When you've got tandem stenosis like this, you have to go for both of them in one setting. So we place the proximal stent first in these cases, take a soft guiding through it. And then we did the distal angioplasty. And then the problem was, the stent was a long one because we want to place it all across like this. It just wouldn't go in. So that happens as soon as you take a long balloon mounted, although the wire was distal, it just doesn't work out. And in this, some of these cases, in order with soft guidings, distal excess catheters, we were able to take the guiding across the stenosis. And then you can see the, then only the stent could track and then we could deploy and open this balloon mounted stent. So this technique is being used nowadays that sometimes you can do angioplasty and with very soft distal excess catheters, one can cross the stenosis with the guiding and then take the stent in. It goes in very easily within the guiding and then withdraw the guiding and place the stent and you can take the balloon mounted stent pretty distally. 
Another case we like in vertical artery, we really like to use balloon mounted stent, cerebellar infarct, severe stenosis. Again, the guiding is higher, right at the stenosis. This is the key. You cross it with a wire, and then you can see guiding is right there. Do an angioplasty, and this is the balloon mounted stent. Again, we always do a post vaso CT to see the wall opposition and how everything around is. Is it always so good? Sadly, no. This is one of the my nightmare cases. This was a young lady, not too old, 46 year old, but diabetic, hypertensive, carotid artery stenting done, coronary artery stenting done, and had retinal attacks. Severe stenosis here, multiple embolism, and look at this vaso CT. This is the plaque, so you realize it's very complicated, heterogeneous plaque with patchy calcification within it. Maybe that should have been the warning. Well, we went ahead, did angioplasty, followed by wingspan, initially looked fine but again had embolism and there was a rectal stenosis now. We did a balloon angioplasty and we thought now things will settle down. But sadly, she again had embolism. It was crazy. We didn't know what to do and she didn't have any ACOM or PCOM. Again, a severe re stenosis. This time we struggled a lot and we looked to a drug eluting balloon. Now that's another thing. If there's a re stenosis, maybe the best answer is drug eluting balloon. But only thing was, at that point of time, these were very stiff and very difficult to navigate, but we managed to take it. We did some angioplasty, it looked good, perfusion became normal. Sadly, the disease kept progressing and she did have repeat events and ultimately the artery occluded in this case. So it's not that every case of stenting does well. As I mentioned, we have to be very selective in picking up these patients. These are not like carotid where we chase each case. What are the other options? Surgical options have been tried. Bypass surgery has been studied. But uh, bypass surgery, uh, ECIC bypass, but there was no benefit and the risk of stroke was much higher in patient uh, receiving bypass. What are the future research being done? Medical management, maybe we need more uh, evidence about low dose direct oral anticoagulants, whether they'll be safer than warfarin and more effective than antiplatelets. In antiplatelets, whether ticagrel or, or pasugrel, whether they can play a role instead of clopidogrel, less resistance and maybe more effectivity. Some studies have already shown that patient with hemodynamic, we have to study the hemodynamics in these patients. And they've shown that if there is an impaired distal flow, there is more chance of stroke. And maybe these are the kind of patients we should pick up for standing angioplasty. Another study again has laid on this pyramid parameters when there's more than six second perfusion delay and of more than 15 ml area uh, and, uh, and or border zone infarct pattern, then there's more chance of repeat stroke. So a lot of, we can use hemodynamics to decide which patients will have repeat strokes and intervention will be needed. Other studies being done in which they are doing now quantitative MRA for the flow, including TCD for flow as well as arterial embolism to understand how ICAD is behaving and how we can optimize our treatment in these patients. Now coming to the next part, which is Moya Moya. All right. So these are, this was mainly about ICAD. In Moya Moya, uh, typically this was a paper published or a review of 28 pair procedures and there was no evidence that any angioplasty stenting worked. But Moya Moya also had hemorrhagic complications, which is because of the collaterals. So Moya Moya can develop these various uh, perforator collateral from lenticular striat and choroidal vessels and, and other vessels. And because of increased hemodynamic stress on these perforators, with time they can develop aneurysms. So aneurysms can happen in three to 14% of adult patients in aneurysm Moya Moya. They can be peripheral major uh, or major vessel uh, aneurysms. The peripheral aneurysms mostly, they're more commonly on the choroidal artery, they can be true aneurysms or pseudo aneurysms. My experience, they more look like pseudo aneurysms and we do endovascular treatment in these patients and usually we just glue them. This is one of my patients and in which patient had hemorrhage. You can see this, this is a moya moya. You can see there is a small distal aneurysm uh, on, on the choroidal artery. We can see it very well here. And on 3D, we can see this is a choroidal artery and here we're giving like a collateral. This is the aneurysm here, we took in a micro catheter and, and, and this was stasis there and the glue injection. And you can see post glue, you can see that artery is gone and stasis within the aneurysm. The rest of the collaterals are preserved. In my experience, if you can go very subselective, it's pretty safe because when the aneurysm rupture, probably those collaterals stop working anyway. And we like to glue them if possible. The main aneurysms on the major vessels are because of hemodynamic disturbances. And, 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 and uh, in these cases, if they're ruptured, we have to do coiling in these patients. Like this is one of my old patients when I was in all Institute, massive hemorrhage along with ischemia. Because these patients, when they develop vasospasm, because there are very few, uh, a, the, the backup is very poor. They do tell you develop ischemia a lot. Angiogram shows classical moya moya bilateral IC injection, classical moya moya pattern, not in detail, angiogenesis and collateralization. And this is what patient had, because the PCA, 
right PC is almost gone. The left PC is giving a lot of collaterals. So you have a big aneurysm around here and you can see the degree of collateralization from the posterior circulation. And this was the aneurysm, we coiled it and we also experienced a little bit more of thrombus formation in these patients and I presented series in various forums. Now coming to other part, the last part is the dissections, which Rodarad also slightly touched upon. Most of the dissection, we treat them medically, but it is very important to recognize them on imaging. Like this patient had posterior circulation stroke, young man. And then what we see here, when you see the MRA, you can see these flaps, irregular flaps in the basilar artery. When you do the axial imaging, one can see them even better. You can see this classical, there's a flap here. This is a case of basilar dissection. We just treat this patient by medical therapy. And I, 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 I don't remember a case where I had to intervene. We give single double interpolated for some time and then single interpolated. We always do a repeat CTA to look for any aneurysmal changes which may develop in these patients. And after a while, we even stop the single interpolated in these patients. Imaging remains very important in these patients. For example, this patient with pica infarction, and 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 this is the uh, uh, this is the uh, I'm sorry, the video is not working. This is the uh, vertebral artery which was later on distally which was stenosed. And when we do a fat suppressed T1 imaging, again, some issue with the video, I'm sorry. What we could see hyperintensity within the wall, as Dr. Rasna was already showed, then you know this is dissection. And where the clot is, that becomes bright on T1 weighted imaging. And most of these cases, we treat them medically, as, uh, unless until there is an androsmal change, we treat them medically. And most of these patients pretty well. And actually, the stenosis open up in a lot of patients on follow up. But if need patient have recurrent attacks on medical therapy, then we can do angioplasty and stenting. Last part is vasculitis, and the studies have shown we really don't like to intervene by intervention methods in patients with vasculitis. So I want to conclude by saying that medical therapy and lifestyle modification in terms of ICAD remains the mainstay. Recent studies have shown that selected cases of ICAD do benefit, and we can reduce the complication rate by careful imaging and technical considerations and by waiting for a week. It is a pretty safe procedure in those cases. Moya Moya, there is a role of intervention in hemorrhagic cases. Dissections, most patients will respond to medical therapy, but very unusually, if there's a recurrent attacks, then stenting can be done. Vasculitis, we like to avoid any interventions. Thank you. Wow, Vipul, exhaustive, but awesome. Thank you so much. In fact, I, I'm wondering whether, whether I need to actually talk at all, but let me just summarize <laughs> for my own sake. So I guess all of us, you know, whenever we talk about strokes, we definitely need to subtype a stroke patient. And, I, and that's mandatory that before you discharge a stroke patient, you know what subtype it is. So therefore you have the stroke prophylaxis well on board. And that's in fact one of the, you know, get with the guidelines or whatever program that you may employ, never discharge a stroke patient without subtyping. Once you have subtyped and you have evidence of an intracranial arterial disease or an intracranial arteriopathy, now we know it is a big spectrum. And especially in this part of the world and evidence you know, your red flags are when you have a younger population or when you don't have conventional risk factors, which account for an atherosclerotic ICAD, all your antenna have to go up and you look at the other spectrum, even though they're not in your face, vasculitis or moya moya or what have you. You're still looking at that spectrum, especially in a subgroup, which is younger and don't have a conventional risk factors in them. What looks like an ICAD on a routine vessel imaging can still be atherosclerotic, could be vasculitis, could be moya moya, could be dissections, could be RCVCS. Of course, there are clinical parameters which could well substantiate. As Raj said, when there is a radiation history, then you obviously are looking at that. So therefore, you would have a clinical background, which again would help, but there would be a big subset which you won't have anything else supporting you and you're left out in the deep sea. And then you will have to fall back on what advances that you've garnered over the years. So in that, you will have to your rescue these advances in vessel imaging, the vessel wall imaging, which you definitely add on to your luminography so that beside a stenosis and other conventional imaging, 
you will also have all these things which have been so superbly enumerated by raj which will help you differentiate in the spectrum of diseases but you should know that there exists this spectrum to be also interpret what you get on the vessel you know small imaging and then you have this issue of if you're looking at an eye cat which is atherosclerotic and believe me you know even our experience dr rohit is I, i i hope he's still there and he would remember that just before this covid hit us and we were uh, you know our regular stroke services we had back to back three patients all between the age group of 35 and 46 three of them with eye cat recurrent stroke features and all of them initially been put on antiplatelets and you are one of them was actually you know a diabetic as well you know the diabetic world i mean we are, are lots of diabetes one in five is a diabetic one in three is a hypertensive after the age group of 30 years so this is this is something which is there well and turns out that and all three of them in fact have been referred for one for as a moya moya the other as as you know as an eye cat and atherosclerotic and for interventions and all three of them actually turned out to be uh, you know focal vasculitic pathology all three of them are on immune suppression so it 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 this this really is building upon and this would be be of great help now besides the fact that you have a medical management as vipul rightfully said yes the medical management is also improving we in fact now have trials on pcsk9 inhibitors so that's an ongoing trial there and you have higher doses of statins and you also have as uh, vipul said you have this combos which also include a noac like rivaroxaban very small dose along with a small dose of antiplatelets in icat and you have this even the duats not for 90 days but a full one year and there is very recently one of uh, the trials rohit is a principal investigator in that which is part of the instruct uh, you know the trial network across the country where we are trying to look at icat in icat giving duat for a period of 12 months instead of 3 months so these are all ongoing stuff and as far as ticagrelol and aspirin which was you know which was a take off it was a spin off from the socrates trial they thought that is an extremely high risk group let's try this they just just you know have seen the results unfortunately that's a negative trial again so probably we still not hitting the the sweet spot of what exactly would be those kind of interventions which would be medically safe but then and then so we have the clinical parameters that we continue to have these events while on being the best optimal possible medical management but we also now probably can add on with the advances in trying to look at the perfusion beyond the stenosis whether it's in form of some kind of an advanced perfusion imaging or looking at transcranial doppler and looking at anabolic signals essentially trying to look at how the blood flow is across that segment how soon how much and again the collaterals and if you look at if you if you if you listen to andrews you know demchet stop he always says the collaterals and you know the core and the collaterals probably is the crux of whatever the interventional program whether it is a large artery whether it is acute or whether these kind of events is maybe it, it would all revolve around that and and i'm sure raj would agree with me on that then you know with this this kind of a system there and with all these advances i'm sure you would have questions on how exactly to perform those advanced vessel imaging what are the protocols when you actually come down to brass tacks okay on the ground what's been your you know this is all very high flown and we are talking about oh advanced imaging and you know you do that but when you're actually hands on this is not definitely simpler and vipul has made out these things about you know putting in a wire go across put a mount and do this and you see this fantastic images but believe me even after the sample trial the editorial said unless until we have the safe landing procedures you're not getting into it now essentially it has left the room to improvement that with this amazonian advances you have in biomedical engineering and as vipul so rightly summarized the experience the local experience you have these gadgets and you have the expertise the flexibility and this this you know immense 
immensely advanced technologies which you now fortunately have both in terms of infrastructure as well as the personnel who are so well trained and available with you these things would be you know a routine of the day and we always seem to follow the cardiologist so i'm sure these interventions are going to come and stay with us and go advanced it makes sense something is blocked you need to unblock to get that that circulation going except that we just need that safe procedures to be able to do it we need to do it in time and we need it to do it safely and get the right patient at the right time and the right procedure by the right person and i guess you know <laughs> at the right place so said that i think we can now open for questions if there are any and if there are still die hard people still participating after this marathon session so vipul you can you can see if there are some burning questions and so, you can answer them the interesting part is today i am i was i was a trained neuro radiologist and and a terrific neuro radiology talk was taken by our international neurologist dr rashiva so hot times change and i remember 15 years back you started talking about it aims we have to know this specific diagnosis by that time stroke was aspirin and you were trying to do tp and you start talking about we have to know the true diagnosis and it was a newer concept for us to think around and and that got all of us interested so i think i will just go quickly over the questions and what is the protocol is the angio i mean i think they want to know the protocol of imaging and raj uh, you will have to unmute yourself and i think dr padma has also mentioned this part and i think there going to be more question about vessel wall imaging than intervention here so can you quickly tell the protocol and you know how to do it you know and whether you need a system so, system yeah, yeah. or what so i think we just uh, we don't need any specific software for it we just use a higher magnet strength that means higher signal to noise ratio and uh, i mean there are set protocol that are uh, already defined which we have in our uh, systems in place we have a neuro radiologist who's helping us out with the protocol definition and uh, so we do a mr tof imaging and based on the tof imaging we localize the stenosis but you have to do the you have to plan it on the scanner because when you do the axial cuts uh, the coronal and the sagittal cuts it has to be say for for example they'll just do it uh, uh, like uh, they they will try to cover the the segment of the vessel but they'll not look at the axis of the vessel so you have to look at the axis of the vessel and if you want to have a cross sectional image then you have to take that uh, region of interest in that particular plane otherwise then you will not get the imaging you can't interpret the imaging well and uh, regards to in details that is a different seminar i'm not going to go into the details i think we'll we'll have to have a radiologist uh, perspective to that i'm uh, I have to uh, dr rashnivas is in a team and uh, dr nishchin jain is from aims dm neuro radiology is part of a team so i'm very lucky i don't even look at these images both of them go through them and make the diagnosis i think they will be very open that more detailed discussion about the imaging part and helping the patients that they are not able to demonstrate the vessel wall enhancement you can always contact us directly i think we can give our numbers and dr rashmi was on exchange and and you know they can tell you a bit more detail what may be going wrong uh, you know if there is no enhancement and dr trilochana also asked about any specific software and as dr raj has already answered that we don't need uh, any um, uh, such special software there is another question that low shear pressure and site of atheromatous plaque the proposed theory is it contradictory to hypertension high shear pressure causing atherosclerosis now raj you have got this thoughts going uh -huh. please answer mm -hmm. yeah, i think it's I, a I, very i want padma to have some i can see she also i would like you to also put in some words i mean what do you think about this atherosclerosis origin and shear pressure yeah yeah right no but I, i i don't think that that is contradictory okay raj you didn't say it's contradictory it it is basically you know what probably they're saying is when the jet is hitting the the surface of an artery versus that you know what what raj probably said that the flow is is not what raj said is actually true you have sort of a bulb and there is a flow because there is a bifurcation it is hitting the bifurcation and it is getting you know deflected isn't that yes yes, yeah. yes. so that's so. how it's going there and there is a swirl these are all the hemodynamics actually basic physics but if you have to look at a hypertension and a velocity that's what's happening when there is a stenosed artery you have a direct jet which is actually damaging the endothelium 
so the shear stress there is when when it is hitting an area it damages so what is proposed and what has been presented is not contradictory it is that those hemodynamics in a big artery when a big artery is bifurcating into two major arteries the hemodynamics the physics there are not completely one jet hitting one point that's why it is probably different and that's what i as as a 12th class physics person can say <laughs> you know we can't even go beyond that but i, I suppose that's how it is isn't it yes, raj sir. absolutely ma'am so i mean wall shear stress is a very nice topic i mean like uh, it's a it's been a passion for me to look at physics but not not only here in mechanical thrombectomy also i've been uh, trying to incorporate physics in whatever we are trying to say and as you said ma'am the, the the they say that the low shear stress is more of a problem uh, uh, rather than higher shear stress higher shear stress causes endothelial injury and endothelial erosion low shear stress somehow increases uh, uh, the activation of pro inflammatory uh, sort of cytokines like a tnf and interleukins and therefore migration of these macrophages and uh, formation of foamy cells and uh, a more of a positive remodeled artery so normally we think that high shear stress will promote atherosclerosis rather high shear stress uh, uh, is uh, sort of uh, helping out uh, in terms of preventing plaque progression but low wall shear stress to the contrary causes uh, promotes atherosclerosis in the wall and plaque progression and plaque rupture and bifurcations are very very interesting so i had discussed about why uh, where the side branch origin side branch angulation and why the plaque forms in the wall opposite to the perforator and all of these are explained by wall shear stress and flow patterns is very very complex i have tried to simplify it as much as i can beyond yeah, this i am no, also out of my knowledge no 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 <laughs> but there's one thing that you know if, if I, uh, hypertension is bad hypertension course, is really really bad <laughs> yes, but yes. then but remember that chronic hypotension is also bad yes. and when you have a chronic when there is a low you know the pressure head to the brain especially when there is stenosis and there is some amount of hypoperfusion wherein your pressure head is needed yes, and yes. that actually translates to increased white matter ischemia and that also contributes to cognitive dysfunction there's a lot of literature on chronic hypotension also causing that so yes. it's 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 like it's again it's a you uh, you know yes. it's never a, a, a just a linear figure of this is good and this is bad so yes, yes. i mean raj you explained it really well right. i mean uh, while <laughs> reading for this i read about the stents and we see this new intimal hyperplasia new atherosclerosis which develops on stents and i have always been thinking what is, could be the reason one of them if, of course you uh, you rupture the plaque the me uh, the intima and the media that is one of the major causes but again there also the sh the, the dynamics the physics plays a huge role it seems so if it's a malaposed stent so what happens is just beyond the stud there is a area of low shear stress and this promotes atherosclerosis new intimal proliferation and it's really fascinating to read about this <laughs> you need a lot of <laughs> so absolutely great as you read about it a long time back and it's <laughs> terrific to hear about now the so science how science has advanced about it and we are learning more new things so there's another question i'll just quickly go over the questions what is black blood mri there is a question raj if you want to answer uh, so the, the here we just uh, remove the signal from flowing blood so that is what is black blood mri so you, if you don't remove the signal from the blood you will not be able to look at the wall of the artery so it, it's just an M mr sequence wherein it's a spin echo sequence with inversion recover recovery sequence so you need to know the basics of the mr otherwise it's going to dif be difficult to understand it so we just remove signal of flowing blood from within the lumen of the artery great and uh, the, the next question for me actually that waiting for a week is best but patient with acute stroke from back me and we see that there is a luminal clap due to icat that's a different disease i didn't touch upon it i thought that will create a lot I, i brought out paper then i decided not to go there because it will create confusion we that is a different disease so you are doing two kind of procedures one is for acute stroke which are improving the patient and what i only talked about preventing further strokes acute stroke is a different disorder completely yes in those cases sometimes we do underlying icat in our practice we try to avoid a stent at that stage sometimes we give a little bit of injectable antiplatelet because mainly is platelet aggregation which is causing it and we do a sub maximal angioplasty and we try to avoid stent in our experience at least 
when you place stents in emergency we have had more complications you know world literature but also there are very good papers now even with the credo stent there's a multi center study published from europe uh, where they uh, in in lot of centers in west they just straight away go and place a stent and while they use injectable endoplatelets in these patients uh, as well but approach can be some injectable endoplatelets angioplasty it doesn't work out then you have to place a stent in emergency then there is no waiting you are trying to improve the patient in these patients now another question is about severe keratotic stenosis with recurrent chia with icat i think there's a tandem stenosis which i showed you have to you have to do both because what happened again is hemodynamics again i will i can go to the physics of it i'm just doing by my common sense if you place a stent distally and proximally artery stenosis then the flow is low this all this and raj can put into better words than me and better english but to me as a simple man you know slow flow means trouble with the stent and you'll have thrombus formation issues and occlusions and re stenosis so if there are two two severe stenosis then the only choice is to open up both uh, as i showed so another question is a vessel wall imaging uh, should all cases of stroke be subjected to it so i will ask this to ma'am i mean what is your feeling about when should we be doing and that's a very important question vessel wall imaging right so when you have a stroke again clinically the vessel imaging is part and parcel of a stroke in fact in the acute stroke vessel imaging is there right so the vessel imaging is part and parcel of your management level a evidence grade a recommendation but when you're looking at beyond the vessel imaging to a vessel wall imaging that's where you have this criteria where i've brought in when you are subtyping beyond the usual subtypes of a large vessel small vessel lacuns and you know cardiomyelic and others and what have you so you have this group of so called cryptogenic which are not fitting in or you have two subtypes coming in and especially in a group wherein it is not being explained by what is happening and they are not confirming or they are not responding to your usual stroke prophylaxis program there are two things if you look at even the interventional thing you have recurrent events being on best possible stroke prophylaxis program okay that is pretty simple but beyond that you also have strokes happening which you cannot explain by the usual factors that you have take a 40 year old with no vascular risk factors has an icat sitting there all right could still be atherosclerotic but you would like to do vessel wall imaging because the risk factors are not commensurate to explain what you see on a vessel imaging number 2 he continues to have events on your best possible prophylaxis program that's another area where you have to get your vessel wall imaging so remember it's not always stenosis which is explaining there are now as we say what is called as on a vessel wall imaging you're picking up the plaques which are not causing significant stenosis which are bad with a high plaque risk score or even in fact those vessels which have an issue even in atherosclerosis which are irregular which are ulcerated in your normal vessel imaging you'll never pick them up but how do you know because they're not improving on your prophylaxis program and they continue to have events so two things one a group where the risk factors don't tell you why this person is having a stroke number two is when they continue to have events in your prophylaxis program and you can't explain why in both these situations you must do vessel wall imaging and it doesn't even only include icad even in external even in extra cranial also sometimes it helps so vessel wall imaging is important i think if this course is a take home message broadly let's leave other things out just remember these two you'll be able to pick up a lot of these methodology it's terrific absolutely terrific so another question is uh, i think directed towards me i guess any technical recommendation regarding heavily calcified icat now first of all i have seen very few heavily calcified sometimes keratotic bulb you have got dense big calcification in my experience intracranial these are mostly ruptured plaques soft plaques so sometimes you have patchy calcification only one case i have seen of the dense calcification i don't really change much i mean some people prefer balloon mounted stent to expand the artery i mean to me intracranial vessels are thin i don't want to do some very aggressive balloon so i will do the same some maximal balloon artery opens up place a stent and of course you want to stent with good radial stent there 
Another question is that intracranial hemorrhagic stroke patient needs evaluation of imaging of intracranial artery, which is spread CT angio or MR angio. DSA is best. I am, it's very clear. Ischemic stroke should be non-invasive first. Very selected cases DSA. Hemorrhagic stroke still DSA remains the gold standard. I mean, very clear. But if you don't have DSA, I would say uh, it depends upon your radiologist what they are more comfortable with. But otherwise, I think still CT angio may be better. You can see smaller vessels better. You can see artery venous shunt sometimes better and everything. So then CT angio. Otherwise, ideally, you have to do a DSA. Now in ICAT, any role of thrombolysis? Ma'am, would you like yeah. to see? Yeah, acute stroke, fine. Please, acute ischemic stroke, don't bother about subtypes. Lacoons also use diaries. We've had that, what, huge amount of data. Acute ischemic stroke, your subtype is not going to matter because that is time is brain. Clot somewhere, unclot it. That's it. I mean, there's no term called unclot. Take it out. Yes, thrombolysis is there. Of course, there are now issues of whether you need to bridge, you go in directly. Let's not get into that. That can be another webinar. But at this point of time, yes, thrombolysis, yes. Okay, so there is another question. Uh, ICAT, uh, let me go on ICAT again. Do you differ in time or indication to intervene between anterior posterior? No, it's one week. And another differentiation can be at the size of the infarct. But you know, most of the cases end up intervening when the infarcts are smallish. So only reason I may postpone in any other case, if the infarct is big and, and then you are too worried about hemorrhagic conversion, then we may wait more. Otherwise, it doesn't make a difference. That anti but my experience has been, and Dr. Raj has noticed this, somehow we see much more repeat events when bilateral ICAD is there, bilateral intercranial vertebral artery, some of these patients has a downhill course. And most of these cases, we end up intervening ultimately. So that is with no PCOMs. These are one patient which remain very unstable. And we have learned with time that they are the ones which will need intervention. But timing remains the same. And another question is that any stroke routinely, we can go for vascular imaging. I think vascular imaging is part of yeah, evaluation. Yeah, already stroke. said that. Yeah. And um, uh, anterior versus posterior. Again, do you recommend maintaining mean arterial pressure between 70 to 90 as a routine in most cases of mechanical thrombectomy acute stroke? I mean, uh, Raj, would you like to answer this? In mechanical thrombectomy, nowadays he's doing more than me. So, so I think uh, so pre pre before opening the vessel you just made whatever blood pressure is there we would like to maintain the same pressures but post thrombectomy if you have been able to have a TK3 or TK2 B reperfusion then you can reduce the blood pressures and it doesn't really uh, make a difference so pre I would be careful not to reduce it pre thrombectomy particularly with GA I would allow maybe a five to ten percent drop in systolic ten percent not beyond that yeah that's the key yeah. Be precious Whipple, Whipple, uh, I, I'm sorry to cut in, but can I leave? I mean, you guys continue. Sure, sure, sure ma'am. Sure, I know it's been gone yeah. very long. It's yeah. been two hours. You've been here for two hours. I can imagine. Mm -hmm. right, Thank you. And I, I, you carry on. I'm sure there are more uh, questions coming That's your way. Point. That's one yeah. point. There's a request for you. Okay, madam, please initiate a trial of mean arterial pressure, acute stroke, TPA, mechanical thrombectomy, I care. So that's a request for you. It's a request. Okay. So you decide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Thanks. Thanks thank you for thank, thank you for you. taking time out, ma'am. So uh, another question is my uh, friend, Dr. Nitin Dange. Ki Vipul, uh, can we go ahead with think of IVAS, intravascular ultrasound, designed for neuro and taking a call on stenting selection and placement zone? And uh, definitely, you know, uh, I was very interested. I was long time back, uh, and frankly, I haven't really researched the topic very recently. Some catheters have been designed for neuro use, but how good they have become, I even I don't know. We we can't we haven't done in India, and the cost issues will be there in the country. But definitely a very good idea, because that can also give you a real time during the procedure assessment of the vessel wall. Another question is the uh, maintain a registry and Asian patient. That is what I had proposed that we should have an ICAT registry in our country. What really is happening in our intervention patients for sure. Um, another question is increased thrombosis in atlas compared to older neuroform. Now, older neuroform I never used for um, uh, ICAD. Okay, my favorite was Enterprise. Newer atlas is very convenient to give. You can deliver through a 1.7 microcatheter. So I've used in a few cases and which you have seen. But of course, Credo becomes even more convenient. You can deliver it through the uh, balloon as well. All right. So uh, older neuroform didn't you? But the paper which was published it showed very good results. 
Now, will you still wait for seven days in case of critical near occlusive MCO basilar stenosis? Very interesting, very nice question. Personally, if the infarcts are not too big and, and the angiogram, the plaque is clean, I may be keen to go before, but Dr. Rasnivas never allows it, you know? <laughs> so that is how it goes. He puts that brief trial in front of us. So yes, but we do tell this patient to stay in the hospital. We watch them closely. If they have a recurrent and they're unstable, then we move in early. Otherwise, by and large, after the weave trial, we like to wait, you know? But yes, we can tell them to stay nearby. If there's any repeat event, they can come in and we can take them patients as an emergency uh, procedure. There's one question about classification, I get and classification in vessel wall imaging. I couldn't understand, you know? I mean, there are, uh, I get classification have been like Mori classification to study the disease in terms of issue in intervention. All right, there are papers about middle cerebral artery distribution of plaques in terms of what it results in complication. But, uh, you know, it's quite late in the day. We can't go into the uh, details uh, of that at this point of time. I think that's the end of questions by and large, you know. And uh, there is another question, which is a long one, uh, Raj, last one, that procedure difficulties in doing a long diagnostic imaging in vasculitis and simultaneous uh, systemic involvement. We posted a stop because of additional renal involvement in C and CAP positive vasculitis patient with recurrent ICH. So, yeah, these are diagnostically difficult to hold. Sometimes you don't get, you need cooperative patients. They take uh, more time than usual studies. Yes. But most of these patients are the ones which don't have systemic involvement. Right, Raj? I mean, this is where the challenge comes Yes, in. yes. When the systemic involvement, it is much more easier. So, yeah, because... Yes, yes, only when there is no systemic problem, that's when we are very, uh, and uh, one of the key messages is, I mean, even the papers have said that vessel wall imaging adds significantly over and above the luminal imaging to identify what could be the problem. Oh, great. Uh, I think thanks a lot. I can see some uh, uh, great for Rohit to come in. I would have loved to have his comments, uh, you know, and uh, some of my friends from Bangladesh, Dr. Siraji has also joined in. It's good to see all of us and it's a pleasure. It was a very long session, but still quite a few are here. And um, and I want to thank Dr. Raj Nivas, my colleague, because it was his idea. He has been very interested. And I said, we are very open to future discussions one-to-one -one about establishing the protocol in your own institutions. Raj, would you like to say something? Yeah, just thank everybody for attending, taking time off. Uh, so, yes. I think now we can stop the uh, session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much.